Hi everyone, I'm Jenny and I'm currently a PhD student at UNSW in Sydney. As a PhD student, I've had the pleasure to teach a couple of courses that have involved teaching R to students. I've learned so much from the students and teaching the courses in general that I recently decided to write an introduction to R blog to share everything that I've learned. This blog is aimed for beginners, so people who may have heard of R but have no idea where to start. While I find R blog super interesting and helpful, I think tutorials can make learning a programming language even easier, so I've decided to create this tutorial to go along with my blog. I'll walk you through the different sections of the blog and show you examples in R and R Studio as we go. So here, this is my personal website, which I just wanted to show you because this is where the blog is located if you want to follow along with the blog. And as you can see, we have the table of contents on the side. There's a lot of information here. Um, and I think I'll actually split up these tutorials. So in this first one, I'll go through this first section and then I'll save tidyverse and a few tips about my workflow for a follow-up second video. Okay, so I started off here just telling a little bit more about myself, which you're more than welcome to read but I just want to start this tutorial with the basics of getting everything installed on your computers. So you'll have to install R and download R Studio in order to get started. Now, R is a free open source programming language, which is often used for statistical and data analyses and visualizations. On the other hand, R Studio is what we call an IDE, so this is an integrated development environment for R, which just makes it really user-friendly and easy to work with the R program programming language. So the first thing you'll want to install is R, and you can do this from the CRAN website. And I suggest downloading the latest version, whatever it may be. So if you're on a Windows like I am here, you can just follow this link, which takes us to the CRAN website and just click on download R. Uh, right now it's 4.1.2 for Windows. Of course, I already have this downloaded, so I'm not going to reinstall it, but go ahead and click on that. As you can see, it's actually been updated since I wrote this blog, which was not so long ago. So you can see how they are constantly updating and making R um, even better all the time. The second thing you want to download is RStudio. So we can go to this link. Uh, and here, uh, most likely, you'll just want to use the RStudio desktop, the free version. So you can just click download here. OK, great. And, and now one thing to note, sometimes um, you might see online courses or tutorials or if you're part of a workshop, you might be using what's called RStudio Cloud. Uh, and you don't actually have to have either of these installed if you're just working on the cloud because everything is already um, uploaded to the cloud. But this is specifically if you want to work on your local computers or laptops. And I will point out here that although you absolutely need to have R installed, most of the time, at least for me, I never actually use R because we can do everything within R Studio. But with that being said, I'll just quickly, I will open up R just to show you what it looks like. So here it opens up what's called the R console. So you can see we have the R version, a little bit inform of information about R. And then at the bottom, you see this little red um, arrow and highlighted here. So within the console, we can actually get coding straight away. So we can do the most basic commands we can do is using R for a calculator, you know, so it's something as simple as just typing in 10 plus five and clicking enter and we can see it returns the output. And now of course, there's a lot more complicated things that you can do in R and even within the console. But I just wanted to show you what it looks like, and I'm not even going to bother saving this, and we'll just um, 
open up our studio because that's really what we'll be working with. So that's the next section here, getting familiar with our studio. And then in my blog, you can see I point out there are four panes, um, which I'll go through now one at a time. And you'll quickly become very familiar with all of these panes as soon as you start, you know, really doing anything in R. Okay, so I've just opened up R Studio, and as you can see, when you open it for the first time, like I have, there's actually, we actually only see three panes. So the first one we see is the console. So this is really identical to what we saw in R when we opened up R, right? We can do the same commands here, and we can print out the output. But in order to see the fourth pane, which is a really, really important pane, we'll want to open up a new file. So you can do this a couple of ways. I like going on this new file button and you can just open up an R script. You can also go file, new file and open it this way, but it's a bit of a shortcut. So this is what we call this pane up here. I'll make it a bit bigger is what we call the source editor. So this is where we will write our scripts. And scripts are really important because when you actually want to save your work and, you know, if you close out of our studio and you want to come back to your work tomorrow, of course you want everything saved. So this is a way that we can save our scripts and we're turn to the projects and work at a later, later time and just rerun all of the code um, and execute it. And it's a really efficient and great way to um, work. And with our studio, it makes it really easy to do. So in the console, we can type commands and we can see the output, but it doesn't keep track of everything. Whereas if we want to save our work, we can put it in our script. So for example, maybe we want to save this output to a variable called X. So we can type X and usually you might be familiar with doing something like this, where we're just setting it equal to 10 plus five. But in R, we use what's called an assignment operator. And this is just a, um, what everyone does, it's just a standard practice. So this is called the assignment operator. And it essentially, it does similarly to an equal sign, but it's saying that we want to assign this value to X. Okay, now a few things to point out here. It's not enough to just type this. We actually have to run the commands and execute the code within R. So even though we have X should equal 15. Right now, if we typed X, we'll get an error because it says X is not found. So how do we save this information? We have to run it. A few ways you can run it. You can run the current line like this, or my personal favorite is doing the shortcut uh, with, the, with the keys, and you can do Control Enter on a Windows or Command Enter on a Mac. And now you can see I've ran it twice, but as soon as I ran it for the first time, we can look in our third pane over here and we can see the values. So the values here are part of the global environment. So this is where R saves all of our values and objects and um, all of our work from our script that we ran and saved. It will, you can see it here within the environment pane. So now that we see we have X saved, now if we run X in our console, just to show you the example, we can see rather than the error, it returns 15. So now you might be wondering, when do we use the console versus when do we use the script? I like to think of it, I use the console whenever I want to do something one time. So if I just want to explore what a variable looks like or what a data set looks like, I might run the code within the console. But if I'm happy and I want to add it to my script in order to save the work for 
to be able to rerun the code later, that's when I'll add it to my script. So for example, maybe I'll want to run the X here and now I can run both lines and see the outputs there. Okay, great. So now that's a little bit of information about the console, the source editor. There are some other tabs over here, but for beginners, and I typically use the environment tab most often, even now. I guess I really quickly, you can see the history. It just shows you all of the commands that you've recently entered, or actually this is even like the first one I entered. But we'll stick with the environment tab, have that opened here. And now for the final pane, again, we see quite a few tabs. The files, this is just where R thinks you are located. Um, as, we'll, as I'll explain in just a minute, this is, will also show us where our working directory is. So this is the same idea of where R thinks you're located. We also have plots, a plots tab. So if you have a script and you run code that um, produces a plot, it will appear in this tab here. We'll talk about packages a little bit later, but you can install packages or update packages here. This help tab is uh, incredibly useful. I use it all the time. It has um, our documentation for pretty much any function that you might want to help understanding within R. So here, I guess the last one I typed in was to look up the mean function. So let's just, for example, if we are in our files and we just do question mark. So this is telling us we want information about a specific function. So we just type the function name. So question mark mean, now you can see it pops up here and we can see our mean function and it gives us a lot of information about this function. Let's see, as another, another example, there's I know there's a summary function and we click enter and similarly now we see information about the summary. So this might be a little overwhelming at first, but you'll quickly, once you use it often enough, to, um, you'll start to learn how helpful it really is. So first it gives you a description of the function in general. And so here we have summary. These inside the parentheses, these are called arguments. And object, this probably, if you've never used this function before, doesn't mean much to you. But fortunately, if we scroll down a bit more, we have a whole section on the arguments. So here it says the object for which a summary is desired. And because it has object here, this means that we have to insert this parameter. Um, and the dot, dot, dot just means that there are other parameters that or arguments that you can insert, but um, they might not be necessary. And the last thing I wanted to point out, there's a lot of information, but at the bottom of a lot of the documentations, you'll see a section for examples. So maybe you, someone recommended you try out a certain function that you've never heard of. You look up the function, you get a sense of what the arguments are, but you want to see it in action. So you can so this is a really good example of where to test it out in the console. So we can just copy and paste and, and it, it prints out a summary of, I actually don't even know what this is. So this must be a data set. So we can take a look at this. There's another function called head where it shows you the first six rows of it. So within this data set, we can see these are the variables, and now if we just want a quick summary, we can put this in. And here you see, this is the output from the summary function. So that's really useful. I encourage you, if you ever are confused about a function, to just, again, use the question mark followed by the function name.
Okay, great. I think the last thing in this section I just wanted to point out, you probably have noticed that your R Studio might look different than mine because I have my settings for this black background. Um, this, of course, won't change the programming or the coding whatsoever, but it's just your personal preference. If you go to Tools, Global Options, under Appearances, you can play around and choose um, the different theme that you want. So some of them have the dark backgrounds, some of them have the light backgrounds. I am using, just in case you like the one I'm using, I'm using this one. And of course, you'll just have to click apply and then you'll see the changes. Okay, let's go back to, let's see. So that is getting familiar with our studio. All right, so the next section we have here is working directory, which I briefly mentioned, but this is, I think, really important for beginners to understand. And I found this a little bit confusing when I started learning R as it was my first programming language that I learned too. So I mentioned this briefly before, but a working directory, or sometimes it's referred to as just WD for short, is the location where R will look for your file. So this is where R believes you are located. It's like your home base. So how do you know where what your working directory is. If we go to files, we see it says home, but that's not really helpful because I actually don't recognize where I am just from looking at these files. So there is a function called get wd, and our functions, we usually, we have to use the parentheses. So this is saying we want to call this get working directory function. And now it gives us, it prints out the path of where my working directory is. So, so now I know I'm within my documents, which that's not really where I want to save everything. So I actually want to save all of my work that I'm doing right now to my desktop. So in order to do that, we have to set our working directory. So there is, um, there is another function called set working directory. And I use this when I started learning for the first time. However, there is a much easier and I would argue a much better way to deal with your working directories. So in the blog, I go through a couple of different ways that you can set your working directory. But for right now, I'll just actually focus on the only thing that I ever use because it's just so, so amazing. And, that, and that's called R projects. Um, so an R project is really just a way to keep all of your files associated with any project that you're working on organized and easily accessible. So I definitely encourage you to follow along with me if this is your first time to set your um, project. And again, this is really just for people who are working with R Studio on your local computer. If you're on RStudio Cloud, you won't need to worry about setting projects because it's already automatically done for you. So let's get started with our project. At the top right-hand corner, we can see um, this little R cube and it says project. Now, we haven't actually set anything, so right now it just says none. So what we're going to do is click on this button and we, are, we wanna set a new project. I'm not going to save any of this because we'll, we don't need it. All right, so we have a few options for how we want to create our project. You can create a project, a new, sorry, a new directory, which is where the project will be stored um, from scratch. If you already have a folder where you want to save all of your work, if that's already created, you can click existing directory we won't spend too much time talking about version control, but I, I use this if I want to back up anything using GitHub. So if you use GitHub, this might definitely be worth checking out. So for now, I'm just going to select the new directory because I don't have, I just want to create a new folder and save 
um, my project within that folder on my desktop. So now don't we don't we're not going to worry about these for this tutorial, but right now we just want to create a new project. And I'll call it intro to R. Um, so this is probably a good time to point out in programming languages, we really want to try to avoid using white spaces like this. And this is because, um, and this is really true across um, all programming languages, they, they have a hard time dealing with white spaces. So we just want to try to avoid it altogether. And that's, you know, with folder names, um, with function names, with file names. So I typically use underscores. You'll see some people use, I think this is called camel case, where they capitalize some letters. So it's really a preference, um, but I would just recommend staying consistent. All right, so now this is the directory name, and this is actually what our project will be called as well. So you'll see that in a second. And now where do we want? our project um, to live. And for me, I do want it on my desktop, but make sure you browse and select exactly where you want, want it to be. Um, this is really important, of course, because when you close out of our studio, if you want to return to your project, then you obviously have to know exactly where it's saved. Okay, so with that, we'll create the project. And now it's reloaded our RStudio um, window. And now we can see our R project. It actually says intro to R. And remember before, all we saw was the home button here. We actually have this specific path showing us exactly where our project is. And so this is, again, this is our working directory. So just to really show you, exactly what our working directory is. Now, similar to what we see up here, we see we're on our desktop within this folder. Okay, great. So that's really all there is to creating an R project. And you can see once you created it, we have the extension dot R proj. Um, so that's just whenever you create a project that will automatically be the extension. Okay, so just as an example, let's say, even though we haven't actually saved anything, we've closed out and now we want to reopen our project. Rather than searching and going to our studio and then having to figure out where your project is, I always go directly to um, my project, the R project. So you can see we it actually created this folder because we, um, because of, yeah, so we created that when we made our project. And within the folder, we have our intro to r.rproj. So now all we have to do is double click on this. And once again, this is exactly where we were before. And our working directory is automatically set to here. So this is really, really convenient. And now we really don't have to worry about setting our working directory because using the R project does it for us. Okay, so if you set up your first R project, that's awesome and good job with that. Let's take a quick look back at um, the blog. So we went through working directory, R projects. Okay, of course. So now next let's talk about scripts. So. Oh, so I even have an example here. Why don't we just use this example? I'm just going to copy this code. And here again, remember, we have to actually um, create a new script so we can do new script. You can see here it's an R script and I can paste it here. So a few, there are a few things to go over here. Um, first of all, we can see it still says untitled and um, 
so the first thing we want to do is save our work. So we can do control S, you can save it here, you can go file, save, whatever you want. And because we're using the project, it, the R project, it automatically takes us to this folder. So this is where we want to save our work. So I'm going to call it R script. And again, notice that I'm using the underscore. Cool. And you can see it already pops up in our files because we've saved it right here. And you can see the extension is .r because we're using an R script. So now if we close, accidentally close out of that, it's very easy to just open it back up. All of our work is saved. And now we can come and try and go through the, li this, the code line by line. The, okay, actually, I guess before we even go through the code, you can see this first line, it's grayed out. Whereas most of our text um, is not grayed out. And this is because we have a hashtag. And whenever R sees a hashtag, it understands this as what we call a comment, which is where we just leave notes for ourselves. This is really important to do and a very good practice for your future self when you return to your code, um, it's just really, really good to have notes so you remember exactly what your code is supposed to do. The whole point, and comments are really um, important and useful because R knows not to execute anything following a hashtag. So these are just notes for yourself. Um, the code actually won't run, whereas with when you don't have the comment, we can click run and you can see it prints out your script below, uh, not your script, sorry, just the one line below. Again, another way we can do this and you can see as soon as I ran it, my cursor moved down to the next line. You can, I always do control enter if I want to run line by line. So I can run this line and again, we can see that, um, output is printed in the console. Now, this next line, I want you to pay close attention here because if I run it, you might think that it will print the results of one plus two plus three, but let's see what actually happens. Here in our console, it ran the line. You can see it ran the line, but it did not print what it equals. So it did not print six, it just printed the full line of code. Um, be, and what this is, this is happening because we actually aren't asking it to print out X, we're just asking it to run this line of code. But now you may have noticed over in our environment, now we see X and it equals six. So this again, as a reminder, this is where we have all of our values and variables saved. So now that we have x equals 6 here, if we add a new line here and we run that, now we can see it equals 6. Okay, great. So that's a little bit about the R script. Um, and now let's see if I missed anything here. Okay, great. So. I want to spend more time focusing on what we call R markdown. Now, when I started coding, I really only exclusively used R scripts because I didn't even know about marked the R markdown files. However, once I learned about them, now all I use is the markdown file. And markdown files are really a great way they're a great way to create beautiful reports with a mix of texts and notes, as well as your code. Um, and on top of that, you can use the R markdown files to, and they're very, very easy to convert to HTML, PDF, or even Word documents. So let's go back to our studio and we'll just show you an example um, of a markdown file. So I'll keep my script open here. And remember, this specifies the R script, but now we're going to create a R markdown instead. So now we actually have to enter the title of our script. 
uh, sorry, not the title of our script, the title of our actual document. Yeah, I guess which is the script. So I'll title it intro to R. And this is a little bit confusing, but you can actually have spaces here because this is just the title that will go on our report. It's not actually any, we're not actually saving our file yet. So I'll show you what I mean now. So you can see here, I've already entered the title. So that's um, entered in here, but again, it says untitled. So the first thing we're going to do is save our work. And I'll just do that now. So here we had an R script. So I'm gonna do RMD script for R markdown. And again, pay attention. If you wanna pay attention here, you'll see it saves the work and now we have our file um, saved. Okay, so as you can see, when we created the R script, it was a blank file, but when we create an R markdown script, we're actually given this template. Now, if you want, you can delete, delete all of this and start from scratch, but right now I'll actually just walk you through exactly what we see in the template to introduce you to all the different features of a markdown file. So the first thing we I want to discuss is at the very top, you see the three dashes um, with a few parameters with, um, within them. This section is called the YAML. And this is where you can specify some arguments. So for example, we've already spe specified the title. Um, we're going to have it as an output to an HTML document. And you can add other things like, for example, author. I can add my name here. You can add the date and there are other things um, you can Google to add to the YAML, but we'll just keep it at this for now. The next thing, whenever you want to actually write code, you have to work within what we call R chunks. So you can see on my computer, we have some lines of some lines that are grayed out in this section um, with these ticks, and it says R. So this is one R chunk. This is another one, and I think, and here's a final one. In order to create an R chunk you can do that a couple of ways. One, you can go here to create a chunk. And here, of course, we'll be wanting to use the R. So insert a new R chunk. That's one way. Um, we can also do a shortcut, Control-Alt-I, or probably Command-Alt-I for a Mac. I'm just using Windows. And now you can um, have are we can this can just be like what we have in our R script and we can copy and paste all the information here. So that's really cool. Um, so this is essentially as if we're working in an R script. Um, just a few things to point out here. This button will run all of the code within the current chunk. So this is really handy. So we can run this. And you can see it happened really quickly, but it printed out all of our results down here. Let me just uh, show you that one more time. I've just cleared this with control L. And now if I run it, it prints all of it. This button, if you have chunks above, it will run everything up until this current chunk. Um, so you might, this, I actually use this one quite a lot also. And I'll come back to this button in a few minutes. Okay, so that's what the R chunk is. Now you can actually name your chunks if you desire. So for example, this one's called setup. We can do um, uh, first script just as name. Of course, this won't actually make um, influence your code. This is just to, again, help try to keep everything organized. So, okay, so we've talked about the YAML, we've talked about how to write code within the chunks, but the really nice thing with Markdown is that you can also integrate um, text really, really easily using the Markdown language. 
So if we scroll down a little bit with the template, you can see they have all of this text just written outside of the R chunks. So you don't need to remember with the R script, we had to comment everything out. Here, we're just writing pretty much in English, just regular text, regular English. Now, there are some special features that you'll we'll go through a few of them in a little bit, but essentially, it's really easy to write code, leave notes and information for yourself later. Um, okay, so, so I think now the next thing I want to do, so I'm going to save this, the, now to see all of this in action and why I so love these R Markdown files is we have a knit button here. And again, we, just to show you back in the R script, we don't have that knit button. So this knit button, it, it will knit the current document and I'll just click on it to show you what that means. So it's pretty much running the entire document and printing it out and it's outputting it to an HTML document because that's what we specified at the beginning. So if I open this up, you can see it's a .html and let me, maybe I'll just open it up so it's side by side with our code. So we have our title, we have our author that I added, it goes through the code, it, it shows you the code, it prints out the code, and then we also have all of our text. So the R markdown and the text um, is written just uh, in regular fonts here. We have the summary, um, so the output from the summary function here, and even this last plot, uh, sorry, this last um, chunk, we can see it has a plot, which is printed out here. So that's, so this is really cool, and this is what I mean by creating the final report. So you can imagine how easy it is to share all of your um, results, um, and you can even write interpretations and explaining your results very nicely and neatly within these markdown files. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is these chunk options. So when, when we created the R markdown file, there was this, the first chunk is called um, setup. And here we can see it says the options for the chunk. So we can think about this as kind of like the global default chunk settings. Um, usually we'll keep this at the top of our script, so it will be the first chunk. So I'll just move it up here. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the different parameters, but you can see one here is called echo. So right now we have echo equals true. If we scroll down, we can actually see in this final chunk, they set echo equal to false. So this is overriding the um, that global chunk option. And what this is doing, and there's even a note here saying that because echo equals false was added to the code chunk, this prevents printing of the R code that generated the plot. So to show you, we can look here in, so within this first chunk, it prints out our actual lines of code along with the output. However, with here, because we set echo equal to false, we don't see this line of code. So there's nowhere in our knitted document that says plot pressure. It simply just outputs the final results of the plot. So if we set this to true, and now we knit it, we'll be able to see this line of code here. So if you want to share your code, echo equals true is really a really good thing to have turned on so everyone can see your actual code along with your results. There are a lot of other parameters um, and this gear button allows you to modify some of them so you can change this to uh, show output only so that was that echo equals false, um, 
runs the code but doesn't show anything, that would be a different parameter called include. So I'm just going to leave it as we had before. In order to, to see um, more of the different parameters, I'll just quickly show you another useful resource, which is just good to know about. We can go to help. Our markdown has a lot of cheat sheets. So you can see these are a lot of the popular ones and we'll click on the R Markdown cheat sheet. And it downloaded a PDF here. So this is actually a little bit overwhelming even for me. So please don't worry if this is overwhelming for you, but it's just a good resource to know about. Um, it has a lot of information, but right here, I just wanted to point out, we have the different chunk options. So we have echo, we saw include, and there are a lot of different other ones. So this is a good place to come if you're trying to figure out exactly how you want your knitted file to look like and all the different options that you have control over. Okay, let's take a quick look back here. So we've gone through the YAML, the R chunks, Here's another link to just seeing all the all other existing cheat sheets. Okay, and the last thing, we started talking about Markdown, but I'll spend a few more minutes talking about it here. Um, so as I said, all of the text outside of the R chunks are written in the Markdown language or syntax. So this allows you to easily style your text in certain ways. For example, we can see um, using two asterisks like I have here on line 16, you can write in bold. So this here, we have the actual script and here we have the knitted document side by side. Okay, so we can write things in bold with one asterisk, it turns things just to italics. If you use three asterisks on both sides, you can write in bold and italics. Um, the headers, so these hashtags, it's a little bit confusing because with the R scripts, hashtags were to comment things out, but with Markdown, it actually specifies a header. So you can see when we have a hashtag, a one hashtag, it's the number one header. So the font is the largest, whereas two hashtags, it's still a header, but a little bit smaller and th header three, you can see here. Um, there's, of course, so many things you can do, but just a few more examples. Our markdown makes it really easy to add math equations. So you can see this is wrapped around these dollar signs. So this is kind of just the signal that we'll be writing an equation in here. And, you know, Googling is always, will always be your best friend if you want to try to Google an equation um, to to see how you can write it in Markdown, but you can see do it, writing line 23, we can see it turns it, the output looks like this. You can add websites um, and then the link will appear so you can just click on it. And assuming you have files, a picture or something saved within your working directory, you can add images. So here, and you can see um, that here we have our bold italics uh, I've uploaded an image of my parents' adorable puppy. So again, these are just a few things you can do. Um, and the last thing here is that there's this one really cool feature, which is this button. So I've heard of it um, referred to as the pancake button. And now I absolutely love this because who doesn't like pancakes? But it looks like a stack of pancakes. So if we click on this button, you can see it even says show document outline. So we click on it, we can see we do have an outline. There's not much here yet, but what this outline is doing, we can click on it and you can see it takes us straight to where um, this is located within our file. In order to add things to your outline, we will use the headers. So. Let's go to the top. We can do 
first script. And you can even see as I'm typing, it appears here. And let's do, we can do three headers, show a summary. And now you can see it, it actually works like an outline. So the number one header is um, all the way to the left. And once we have our third header with the three hashtags, it indents it. So it's kind of like a sub sub header, I suppose. You can think about it like that. So uh, you can imagine when once you start coding and you're doing a lot of analyses, your, your script might be hundreds or even thousands of lines of code, this makes it incredibly easy to navigate exactly where you want in your code. Um, so for example, if I wanted to run this plot, the first thing I would do would be, well, I wanna run all of the code above, and now I want to run this plot, and now we can see it here. Cool, okay, so I'm gonna save this work. Let's go back and see. So, I think this is a really good place to stop for this first tutorial. Um, on my blog, I have quite a few additional resources if you're really interested in more tutorials to get you started with some of the basics. But I really hope that you found this first tutorial useful. And in the next tutorial, we'll talk mostly about Tidyverse, but we'll also introduce the idea of packages and um, what packages are and how to install all of them. So thank you so much for watching and hopefully we'll see you in the next tutorial.